All right. Uh, thank you very much. We will now start the panel discussion, which will run about an hour. We received quite a few questions that you had written down uh, during the three keynote addresses, uh, ranging all the way from points of clarification all the way to uh, deeper questions that transcend the three presentations. I prefer that people actually ask questions. <laughs> if we can get some, uh, some energy and, and people ask the questions themselves, I think that would be much better. If there's lulls, I will pull out the questions. But for now, let me, let me go ahead and open it up to the floor to see if anyone who has a question they'd like to ask directly. Uh, I made a, uh, the same uh, question uh, in a different story uh, to the Professor Roger Goodman and uh, uh, Professor Takayama about uh, uh, the, the, your idea about the reference of the, the similar or the uh, kind of surrounding society, uh, the, the society surrounding Japan or the, the kind of neighboring country of Japan. And uh, maybe uh, I uh, personally refer to much more East Asia or the Southeast Asia as a reference group, but uh, maybe it is not really, uh, it doesn't have to be limited to that uh, types of the uni uh, countries. My point is that, uh, the, uh, for example, when uh, the last, last week I was in Nairobi in Kenya and uh, the Bangkok in and then the, we had a discussion about Pan-African University, I mean, that the African uh, the research initiative uh, uh, collaborated with China, Japan, and Germany. And also, the, we also had a discussion in uh, the Bangkok about uh, how to really, uh, really find the internationalization of higher education from the uh, East Asian or the Associated Asian point of view together. And there, uh, I think it is not that elegant or not that straightforward theoretically, uh, as uh, Professor Takayama uh, made in a very, very elegant manner. Uh, but uh, there is uh, some kind of a movement that uh, uh, the, the Japan could be a part of the, such a uh, the much larger movement to redefine the, the view of the, the what's going on. Uh, in my case, higher education, but maybe uh, it can be widely uh, applied to education. So that that this is not a, always because of the theoretical uh, excellency, but uh, much more based on a, just a, a changing power balance of the, the uh, society background. So that uh, obviously the Asia and the Africa is now rising than before. So the, uh, the, 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 the one question to the Professor Takayam is that could I ask you to elaborate more about the real idea of the post-colonial so that you didn't mention so much about uh, what does it mean and what does it mean uh, for Japan and the other country. And uh, Professor Roger Gutman, uh, so that, uh, so that uh, I'd like to ask that uh, from your experiences uh, as a the professor of the University of Oxford, that you have many uh, student researchers uh, gathering from all over the world to the St. Anthony's College. And then the, you have a lot of, lots of opportunity to compare or the, the talk with the, uh, the uh, other types of local uh, the, the researchers uh, with uh, uh, of the, lo uh, the research on the locality or something like that. So that uh, so that I'd like to know that the, how uh, what would be the kind of uh, the next uh, post the uh, pathway to energize the Japanese uh, the research from Japan uh, in the field of education. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a really good um, question. Um, so let me start. By saying I really enjoyed uh, Kater's uh, talk, um, I was just thinking of my own background. So, you were talking about core periphery, colonialist peripheral, northern, southern. Um, I think that's me. Um, <laughs> I should imagine that on one level, the University of Oxford is about as core colonialist and northern as it's possible to get. I would have thought that the social sciences division in Oxford would probably be a prime example, except for one thing. More than 50% of the professors in Oxford are not from the UK. Most of them are coming from outside the UK. Many of them are coming from 
China and Japan, as well as from Asia, or other countries in Asia and Africa. I'm not quite sure what these boundaries mean. I mean, I think we're living in a very, some, some of us are living in a very post-colonial uh, world. And if there's one big distinction, possibly between UK research intensives and Japan, Japanese research intensives, it's uh, the internationalization of uh, UK research intensive universities. As I say, 72% of the graduate students in Oxford are from outside the UK. I think it's 55% of the um, academics. And that's why I, one of the things I'm really excited about in Japan is the internationalization that is beginning to take place, particularly I think congratulations to uh, Kyoto University for turning its Hakubi project into a genuine international project and people like Jeremy and, and Keita and so on coming here because that isn't happening at all the Japanese universities at the minute as many of you will be, um, will be um, aware. Um, so I think uh, I, a little bit question, you know, how easy it is to make those um, those um, distinctions. And as you pointed out, Karia Sensei moved from Todai uh, to Oxford, and he's very interested in looking at these different uh, models. But back to the, the question, um, of course, you have to see Japan in a, in a broader um, context. So every project I've ever done in Japan, I have always then gone and done a comparative project in South Korea and asked exactly the same questions in South Korea that I'm asking in Japan. And you find exactly the same answers. And then you think, well, obviously this phenomenon isn't necessarily unique to Japan. Maybe it's, a, um, it's an East Asian phenomenon. Maybe there's something Confucian there. But of course, if you talk to people in South Korea, they don't like that explanation because they like to see themselves, uh, their academics in South Korea, as part of the, the global West because most of the professors at Seoul National and elsewhere have done their PhDs in Western countries and they want to associate with that. So those become very political types of uh, self, uh, self definitions. But take the project that I described at the end about the, the private universities. It's amazing, if you go to South Korea or if you go to, uh, go to Taiwan, it's exactly the same story. The prediction of these universities disappearing, but they haven't um, disappeared. So I think you have to do those kind of comparative uh, projects. And I personally have no problem if you wanted to expand that comparison to any, any parts uh, of the world. I mean, I think you've got to remember what, what is theory. Theory is a way of helping you think about your data. It's a way of organizing um, your data. It's a way of trying to put your data into a framework that can help explain what you're looking at that other people can then use to understand um, what they're looking at. We have to be uh, careful that we don't um, over-fetishize um, what theory is. It's a tool. It shouldn't be more, uh, more than that. Please. えっと、ま、質問にお答えする前に、やっぱりせっかく横に座ってるわけですから、ちょっと会話をした方が面白いと思うんで、こういう会話だけじゃなくて、こうも行きたいなと思って、今その、グッマン先生がおっしゃったこと
一つ、えー、コメントをしたかったんですけども、えー、ポストコロニアルの意味ということですかはいあの、えー、とこの話をあの例えば CIS って聞いた時あのあの比較教育学会のアメリカにあるやつで聞いた時には、はい、あのそこ自体がノームがあるので<笑>あの分かるんですけども。例えば私自身はそこにおいてかなりペリフェリーなのねそうすると実はポルストコロニアの話自体をそんなに私自身正直言えば自分の学問的な中心に置いてなくて自分の目の前にある現実を考えるときに自分に当てはまりそうな国というところであの例えばアジアの国さっきの言えばその支持大学であれば韓国であったり台湾であったりフィリピンであったりというのを見て。それで結果的にやっぱり同じようにノームにぶつかってそれであの対話をするんですけど少なくともなんか孤独な気がしないんですね。というのはそういうペリフェリーにいる人たちがたくさんいてあのブラジルと日本が結構結託して何かを言ってみたりとかいうことが割と起きてるあの緩い世界で生きてるのであのその時にあのなんていうかあのここまでその。高山さんがおっしゃってるように突き詰めなくてもなんとかなっちゃってるというところがあるのがまあ一つあるんですでただその話をしたかったんじゃなくてそういうところから見ると実はあの今おっしゃってるそのポストコロニアルがあんまり多分あの私,はかんない私だけかもしれないけどもそんなにこの日本の中で共有されてるともちょっとあんま思ってなくてあの、えー、と前提としてる概念のいくつかがあの十分に伝わってないのかなという。気がしないでもなくて、その意味であの高山先生が今おっしゃってるクポストコロニアってどういうことなのかをもう一回ちょっと基盤としておっしゃっていただいて議論を進めた方が理解が進むかなと思ったというようなことです。わかりました。こんな勝手に進めちゃっていいですかこうやって司会のジャミさん。あ、わかりました。そうですよね。勝手に話しちゃいけないですよね。<笑>えっと。えーまあ、そのポストコロニアルっていうのは別にそのコロニアルが終わった植民地主義が終わったっていうその時代の区分じゃないですよねそのいわゆる植民時代に作られた地の構造っていうのが依然として継続しているっていうそれを理解するための視点だと思うんですねそこであえて私はそのかつてのまあ,あまり長い時間過ごすことはできなかった費やすことはできなかったですけれどもいかにその植民地時代の知識を作るその実践っていうのがその関係ですよね中心と周辺という関係が、まあ、今日においてもかなり継続しているというそういう意味でのポストコロニアルだったわけですけどもだからその植民地主義が終わったという意味ではないですよねそれがかなり継続しているというだからコロニアルの時代の状況を今日,今日的にその継続性を理解するという意味でのポストコロニアルですけれども。あのもう一つ、えー、先生がおっしゃったそのリージョナルな、えー、東アジアの方々のもうかなり連携が進んでいてしかもブラジルの方ともですね研究を一緒にやられていてあまり孤独な感じがしないというおっしゃっていたと思うんですけどもまさしくそ,うその話を実はあのこのトークでもしようと思ってたんですけども、えー、時間がなくなってできなかったんですけどもいかにその日本の教育研究特にその普遍性といったものに対してですね実証の他者でもまたは認識の他者としてでもですねそれにもの申すためにはですねやっぱり日本だけでここから発信しているだけではもうダメだっていうことは僕は90年代初頭のオリジナル理論を作るってなかなかと私さっき話をしましたけどもあの時のあの出来事がですねやっぱり証明したんだと思うんです。結局日本に特にカリアの先生の研究なんていうのは理論のその地域性ローカル性というのはすごく明らかに綺麗に出して出した研究なんですよね。で、それも英語で書いても、それでも全くそれが理論の最高とかに全くつながらなかったっていうのは、やっぱり結局日本はまあアウトライヤーだからねって終わっちゃうんですよ。日本だけでやってると。だからその意味でもっとポストコロニアルな地の最高の動きっていうのは世界的に起きていてそ,れのその運動と結びつけてやらないといけない、まあ、そういう意味でもポストコロニアルの視点は大切だと思って、えー、言ったわけです。So let me ask a few of the questions that came for Tobin Sensei.、Um, and two of these are quite specific. And let's see, I'll just do three. Two are Rather specific, and one is more blue sky, open, theoretical. So let me start with the, the specific ones.、Uh, the first question is Is this idea of the gallery 
uh, where students watch. Is this, would you say this is something that, uh, that is specific to Japanese culture? Or did you find a similar thing happening in China as well? That would be the first question. You want to answer each of them as we go? Go ahead. Well, I could give both a specific and a more general response to that. I mean, one, uh, in this teaching embodied, Hayashi and I write about the gallery, and we could say that it's been described in many cultures, and there's a concept of legitimate peripheral participation and observational learning. So in anthropology, there are notions of, uh, that have been studies in many cultures about how uh, people don't learn only when they are a, a direct partic participant in the role of student, but we're learning all the time. And maybe, uh, so that's been pointed out. But I think a more general problem is that I think it, maybe it's present in all of our talks a little bit is even in this whole notion of Kyoto school, like when you have a theory, whether it's um, an EMIC concept like Gyarari, or if you're using Watsuji or Kimura, are these theories that come from one place only about that place, or are they more generally theories that could be applied elsewhere? And I don't, or am I? Or I think these are. There's kind of a tension there. Uh, so Gyarari has both, could be that once we see that concept coming out of this um, in our Japanese research, we could then go back to China, go back to the U.S and look for something we'd missed before. And perhaps there's also peripherally participating children in the other countries. Uh, on the other hand, there may be something more specific to the way the concept is playing out in the culture uh, where we first seen it. I'm not sure if that makes sense or if you guys have thoughts about that. If, but again, I think uh, these, maybe it's a question I could ask back to the other panelists, but whether these, theories from Japan, are they simultaneously more about theories of Japan or theories from Japan that would, that have no necessary contextual basis in Japan and are just as applicable any place? So, for example, the gallery is a concept of concept concept ま、トービスへの研究からそう出てくるわけですよね。で、それを今度は外国研究、え、まあ、アメリカの教育でもいいですけども、または全く関係ない韓国でもブラジルでもどこでもいいんですけども、そこの国の教育を理解するのに、
at the same time. I, lots of other children would attack you at the same time, but when they went to the US or the UK, then the fight would be one child would be selected to fight against them. So it sounds like the gallery would have been existing in the US and UK context. And their view of being at a shogaku in Japan was everybody was fighting with them. There wasn't um, a gallery. I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, it, it, I'd never thought about it before. And I guess what that shows is if you introduce a concept like gallery, then you go back and start thinking about things that people told you and think about how does that relate to your ethnographic data that you've got. So it's useful in the sense that it's introducing a new way of looking at your material, which is what I really enjoyed about the example you said Hayashi-san was looking back at the old uh, films, not as data, but as if there was a, a message there, a theory there. It's just a new way of looking at it. And I think that's, that's what any anthropology does. It, you go and spend time in another society, because it's so much easier to see what is happening elsewhere than it is in your own society. And then you come back, call it whatever you want, call it gallery, call it whatever you want, but you look at your own society um, differently. I don't think that's theory, though. I think that's just simply opening your eyes to a different way that uh, humans can interact. And just one other quick comment on the gallery thing is, I think, Keita, alluded to this, he said oh, he wasn't criticizing, but I think it's a, it is an appropriate criticism. Like when we do, there's a tendency when I'm writing, for instance, or with colleagues, with Hayashi or others, about something like gallery in Japan to idealize it and to just emphasize the more positive features because it's kind of saying, well, here's something to American readers or Anglophone readers that they maybe should consider and be more aware of the potential to to switch their gaze from individuals to the group. But there's also, as you're saying, a tendency then to miss what could be some other, some Japanese people have suggested there's some negative side to, to the gallery. But then just to bring it back to theory, when we bring in this notion of visibility and second nome, or the way in which the community is, it controls itself partly through vision, in, our, in teaching a body, we talk a little bit about, but we shouldn't necessarily jump to Foucault's panopticon. Like, how can we talk about something like visibility as both a positive and negative social force, but not quickly assimilate it within Western theories, which have a particular history? But I would just say maybe one other comment about this is, I think across the three talks, we also saw a continuum of how important theory is or where do you start. And uh, so in Takayama's talk, there's this notion that it's really critical that theory be coming from Japan. And he points out that works by me and others haven't used very much Japanese theory. On the other hand, I don't use very much any theory. You know, I think it, the question is, and Roger talked about different thinking about your theoretical orientation. But I think an interesting tension in all three talks was, what do we do with theory? And, is, and does theory lead to raising questions which we then pursue empirically? And I think that's a really good use of theory, but also theory can become a blinder, as you were saying, like if you go in with a certain theoretical, with a Marxist orientation or a Western theory or Japanese theory, it's going to already, to some extent, determine what you're going to see and what you're going to study. Great. Thank you. So I have a question for uh, Professor Takayama. Uh, that, uh, when, you, when you say uh, Japanese ori original, do you refer to the Japanese like before modernization that is free from uh, the Western influence or do you refer to the much more Asian Japan that is free from the like Chinese Confucianism or Indian Mahayama tradition of Buddhism? And that was my f first question. And uh, I also want to ask, is that necessary to make an ontological distinction between uh, like Japan and China or among the countries of East Asia? Like, you can see clearly that from Tobin Sensei's uh, research that there is a clear difference between uh, Japanese preschool and uh, Chinese preschool. But uh, I think uh, also in Professor Rapley's research, he didn't make like very clear distinction uh, in a type two learning like among the 
East Asian countries. So do you think that kind of like a ontological distinction on the level of very deep philosophy is necessary? I might have used the term origin, uh, original theorizing from Japan. Is that what you're referring to? Like origin, the term origin? I think I can think of that's the only place where I use the term origin, original, in my, in my talk. Yes. Like, okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Um, no, I think what I what I meant was really the, you know at the at the uh, the early nineteen nineties, group of Japanese sociologists of education were trying to trying to be the agent in knowledge production. They wanted to create a theory that is that is its own their own production, right? And they wanted to come up with a theory that that is that is relevant to the particular context of Japanese education. And, and that's what I mean by ori original, in a sense that they are the origin of the idea that they're going to use to make sense of Japanese education, as opposed to using theories that are you know, coming from elsewhere, right? So I wasn't really referring to origin in a sense of, you know, is it a reference in, refer in reference to uh, before modernization or ancient Japan? To me, that point is a bit irrelevant to the point that I was making. Okay, it's just a clarification. And uh, I think that you made another point. I was going to respond, but I tend to forget. Uh, oh, so is it is it necessary to make an ontological distinction between China and Japan? Right. I think uh, because I was, uh, uh, that's in reference to Jeremy and Hikaru's work, uh, Komatsu Hikaru's work, right? I mean, Jeremy can probably answer your question, but I would say um, some, some level of uh, a generalization, right? In order to make a point that, that the, the ontological premise of, of PISA testing, the notion of self, as, it, as, as it's underpinning the PISA testing, also the theory, theory of learning that's underpinning the PISA. In order to relativize that, what is considered to be universal, you sort of have to engage in some sort of you know, strategic essentialism in a sense that you construct, at, quite artificially construct, certain general categories in order to argue against what is considered to be universal. Right, and I think Jeremy, if you, I mean, I probably I didn't do justice to the complexity and subtlety of his argument, Hikaru and the Jeremy's argument. But if you read that piece carefully, I think they makes many moves in the article that suggest that they are highly consciously strategic about the way in which they construct these two categories, type A and type one and type two. Right. So. Maybe Jeremy, you, know, you can you can say something in response to the question. Uh, give a question to uh, all three of the. Uh, I, I've put together a few questions that came in for different people, but I think we can uh, combine them into a, a, a kind of very important underlying thread across all three presentations. And this is the idea of how do we surface assumptions. How do we service implicit assumptions? Uh, I think, I mean, the simple question is, how do we do it? Do you have examples? Um, do you have thoughts about how to do it? it? It appeared to me, and this wasn't written in the questions, but that you each did it in a very different way, empirically. Um, Professor Takayama was reading works that had been written and looking at it maybe from also from his experience in Australia or the United States. And Professor Goodman, two points in time and looking at the, the ways that those assumptions didn't hold in one society. So if you could comment on surfacing the assumptions, because it's really at the core of this project, I think. So there was a, a fashion, particularly in the, the 1990s, for what was called reflexive anthropology or reflexive sociology um, linked to certain ideas in postmodern thinking that everything we wrote was nothing more than a reflection of our own um, assumptions. And people began to write accounts of other societies that were actually accounts of themselves. So 
I can remember reading some accounts, some ethnographies, where the first 50 pages would be about their own personal background and all the things that they brought to the study, about the influence of how old they were and their gender. Uh, sexuality was often an important part of this. Um, nationality, uh, all kinds of issues that they would bring to the fore, which they said you needed to understand about them so you could then understand the way they were looking at the society they were studying, say it was Japan, and then you could judge their analysis of, say, Japan against the background of what you knew about them. So they were, they were the research tool, they were writing about Japan, you needed to understand the research tool to understand what they wrote about Japan. That was a very popular um, and sometimes rather, in my view, rather tedious exercise that was really just overplayed. And some of it, I mean, let me be honest, some of it could have been interesting, but wasn't. Um, I mean, what could have been interesting would have been if people had looked at what they thought was the impact of, say, their, their national background, their national identity on the way they study Japan. Um, I took part in a very interesting experiment in the late 1980s run by, uh, people may remember, Befu Harumi, who is a very well-known uh, anthropologist based at Stanford. And Befu Sensei invited eight people who were interested in Japan uh, to go and stay in a hotel in Tokyo. He more or less locked us into this hotel for a week. And he invited eight um, Japanese specialists on our countries also to go. They were also locked in for a week. And we had to discuss what we thought was the main influence of the way we looked at Japan from our national background. And the Japanese scholars had to do the same, looking at us from the outside. And that was very interesting because there was a Korean scholar who for them the key uh, looking at Japan was about kinship. There was a scholar from Russia. This was before 1989. For them, it was about uh, capitalism. There was a scholar from Germany. It was about liberal democracy. There was a scholar from um, the States. It was Robert Smith. For him, it was ethnicity, race. The core variable in um, America is race. And of course, because I was British, it was easy. It was class. Because everything in Britain is about class. And of course, that's true. All my research has become a class analysis of Japan because that's the framework that I bring. I can't look at the world in any different way. So I probably should have talked um, about that. But the one thing I have never, ever seen anybody think about or write about reflexively is what are their theoretical assumptions about the relationship between the person and society. And that's why I gave the talk today, because I actually I think we can understand a lot of research if we can understand that particular concept. So I was less interested about their age and their gender and all those other things. I'd be much more interested about their theoretical assumptions. Now, we can work those out normally through two ways. The first thing I do when I read a book in Japan, the first thing I do is look at the acknowledgments and see who they have put down as the people they rely on. The second thing I look at is the bibliography. And that also gives me an indication of the type of people that they are drawing on to create their account of Japan. And then I read the book. But I shouldn't have to do that. They should be sufficiently self-aware that they should tell me at the beginning of the book what were those assumptions that they were taking when they were doing that account. And I, I, the, the thing that slightly puzzled me this afternoon is we're using theory in two different ways. I'm talking about theoretical assumptions, the way that we think about the world, which means that we then look at something through a particular framework. I think, Kata, you're talking about l bringing theory out of our data. What theories can we develop out of our data? Now, there is a circular part of this, of course, the more we look at something, the more we develop a way of thinking about it, then the more we use that for looking again. But I think we need to be clear when we talk about theory, which part of that cycle 
um, we're actually using. I'm talking about assumptions. We all have them. We all think about the person in a certain way. And we all think about society in a person way, but we need to reflect on that before we start describing and talking about other societies. えっと、アサムションをいかにこう意識化するっていう話ですよね。えー、実は私あれだけ長くお話をさせていただいたんですけども、まだ三分の一ぐらい内容が残っていたんですね。<笑>で、その辺の話をしようかと思ってたんですけども、時間がなくなってできなくなりました。その中でですね、えー、私は溝口雄三の本当は話をすごく深くしたかったんですけどもその中で溝口雄三さんが方法としての中国っていう概念を提示されていてでその概念が、えー、台湾のクワン・シン・チェンっていう方が英語で「エイジア・アズ・メソッド」って本を書かれてでその後にソン・ソンカさんっていうこれは中国の社会科学の研究者ですけどもその方が。まあ、同じようなことを、えー、おっっしゃってるんですねその方法としてのアジアっていう、えー、つまりその中国研究を超えた中国を超えた中国研究をするっていうことですね、えー、その常に、えー、自分自身を恒常的な越境状態に置くっていう言葉を使われるんですけどもその常にそのいくつもの三要点を持つという。レフェランスポイントをいくつも作っていくっていうこれはあのクアンシン・チェンさんがおっしゃってることですけどもそうすることで常に、えー、自分の主体とかですね自分の持ってるアサンプションといったものをあ常にそれを相対化する機会を作り出すっていうのはその鍵となる概念っていうのは結構、えー、溝口さんとか、えー、ソンカさんとかチェンさん、えー、東アジアの研究者の方、まあ、知識人の方から私は多くのことを学んだというふうに思っています。えー、実はその辺の方々の著作を、えー、ベースにしてですね、方法としての方法としての日本という概念を、えー、提示したかったんですけども、それはまた別の機会でお話しできたらと思います。The way I think of research is that the point is to say something new to an ongoing conversation, and so I think it's more about effects than in, intentions. You know, the question for me is like, how, what does this reading, this piece of research, how can it lead to someone leaving? After having read it, will they now have some new understanding that they wouldn't have had before? And so I think you could take theory. Like these days, I've been interested for the first time, partly because Jeremy's been sending it to me, been reading some of the Kyoto School theory. And I find it's useful having read it, then I could then go back to Yo Chien or Hoi Kuan with different questions and different eyes and maybe see something different than I would have before.、Um, on the other hand, I guess I'm just saying something I said before if you go in with too much theory, instead of seeing something new, you'll just end up seeing what the theory would direct you. To see. So if you go in looking for, if you go in with Foucault, you'll end up seeing a panopticism. And so the, you know, for me, the tension is how do we use theory rather than being used by theory so that we can somehow be present in a new way that could allow us to see something new that we could then communicate. That reminds me of a, of a very nice example. You showed a, a slide of Imanishi Sensei, the primary. Was that you? No, you showed the slide of Imadish Sensei. So that、um, reminds me of a, um, um, some very interesting research. So Imadish Sensei was, he worked on, on monkeys in、um, Arashiyama. I think there's a big monkey troop in Arashiyama in, in Kyoto. Some of you may know this story, but in the 1960s, that monkey troop got too big and it, they were beginning to come and down into the city and they were causing problems. So, A large part of the monkey troop was taken to Texas. Do people know this story? And they were put in a monkey, a, 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 a site in Texas. And they were studied by primatologists in Texas. So they were genetically the same monkey group. There were some in Arashiyama and there were some in Texas. And a very brilliant uh, young uh, primatologist called Pamela Asquith. Um, decided she had a brilliant idea. She brought together the, after about 20 years of the research happening in Kyoto and in 
Texas, she brought together the researchers, the primatologists, to get them to compare the research that they were doing on this monkey, or the monkeys, they, they were genetically the same monkeys. And what she discovered that the Japanese primatology research was all about how the monkeys were working together and about cooperation and the group and how they were passing on knowledge. Whereas all the research done by the American primatologists was about hierarchy, about strength, about boundaries. And she just said it was interesting because these were the same monkeys, but they were starting with totally different assumptions about the world. And they were looking at these monkey troops through their view of what society should look like. And I think we do that all the time, okay? I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that Darwinian theory came out of Victorian Britain, because Britain at that time was the greatest country and it needed a theory to prove why it was the greatest uh, country. I mean, all of these theories have a, have, a, have a social context. The worrying thing is we don't often express that uh, or think that. Um, I should say, I think the primatologists were very unhappy with pa Pamela Asquith because they thought they were objectively looking at the monkeys rather than that they were imposing their own anthropomorphic worldview on, onto the monkeys. But we do this all the time. I can only look at Japan as a class society because I'm British. Uh, it's a problem, um, but it's a fact. Lots of things to talk about. Just, I thought I'd ask Roger the question about the very bad predictions made by those three areas of uh, Kikokushijo, private universities, and uh, child abuse. Uh, isn't it true that social scientists are pretty bad at prediction in general? And part of the reason for that is social science gets out into the general world and actors act upon what they learn. And so, for example, the private universities, they would have been reading all those books about the prediction of the, the collapse of private universities. So there's inevitably going to be a, a kind of feedback loop of that kind. And actually, it's not, nothing to be ashamed of if uh, social scientists um, are very bad prediction. It probably, it's probably safer if they don't predict too carefully. I mean, I predicted in my, um, the end of my teacher's union book that the direction taken by the, the more uh, moderate half of the union was a good move to make. But I didn't predict the total collapse of the opposition to the LDP when I was making that prediction. And so now the teachers' union are very, very weak. And so um, that prediction is looking rather silly. But the, the grounds that I made it on at the time were based on evidence at the time. And the, some of the things that you were talking about in the case of Kiko Shijo private universities, those are perfectly um, good assumptions and good uh, observations. So Kiko Shijo coming back to Japanese education system do have trouble adapting back. And I think there still is uh, largely an attitude of um, a zero-sum game in the sense if a child is too long outside Japan, their Japanese list does go down. Now that has probably been modified by what you were talking about, the, 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 the future opportunities for Kiko Kishijo or other, uh, or Yukakse, are much more clear now than they were in the 80s probably. But the problems they may, may face, certainly in certain kinds of school, they, they haven't gone away. And the private university, I, I'm, I think the predictions about bankruptcy, um, to be fair to those predictions, a lot of those bankruptcies have probably been covered up to, to be totally, I, know, I, I actually know a couple of cases of, or maybe cover, covered up is too strong a word, but they, a very, very unprofitable four-year university, which is being heavily subsidized by the other parts of the Gakuen, uh, just because of the prestige of keeping that four-year university. And so they've, they have avoided all the catastrophic bankruptcies of 300 universities going bankrupt. That hasn't happened, but the basic, structural problems and the demographic problems, uh, they were accurate when, when the people said that. So social scientists are, are bad at predicting, but that's not necessarily a problem. So my, my point was a slightly different one. Um, um, I have no problem about social sciences making predictions. I have no problem about them being completely wrong about the predictions. But for me, the interesting thing is why don't they go back and look at the predictions and try and work out with the basis of more evidence about why they were wrong. That's the point I'm trying to make. And normally the reason that they were wrong is because they were working in a certain paradigm with a certain set of assumptions. 
And then it's quite interesting to try to figure when you've moved into a new paradigm, well, what were those assumptions and why did we think like that? at that time. So I just think it's an intellectually good exercise for social scientists to engage in, is to go back and look at earlier work uh, that they did. This is why I, liked, I really like this diachronic approach, because that's exactly what Joe and his team are doing. They're going back and looking at the same data. But we don't do that. We, I mean, to be honest, we collect too much data and we don't analyze most of it. We all know that, because collecting data is the easy bit. Analy and analysis is the difficult bit. So we just keep collecting more data. We all have far too much data. But data from 1985 is still interesting and is still important. And I love the idea of the same teacher um, looking at the same class with the same age group. Uh, was it 20 years apart? 13. 13. It's just brilliant. And getting them to reflect on they, their own practice uh, and so on. But we don't do that very often. We just ignore the old data. And so that's why I was surprised. I mean, the reason I started this project, if you want to know, is because I had, uh, this is Alta Sun's book, where I was sent that. And I thought about the, the problem for private universities that came out last year. And I thought, I've read this book before. In fact, I've read this book many, many times. I read this book in 2003 and four, And then I went back and discovered there were, there were tens of books written then. But there's no mention about that. It's like it never happened. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, what a shame as a social scientist. What a great project. Let's go back and see why did people think that then? And what did happen? And I'm sure there are many universities that are being looked after by the attached senior high schools and uh, Semongako. But why didn't they see that then? Why didn't they think that that was what was going to happen? Because you can't allow the flagship university um, to collapse. So what was the framework that didn't allow them to see what was going on then? That's all I'm really saying. It's just a great social science exercise to go back and see why you made predictions and, and why, they, why they were wrong. Yeah, I quite agree with that. I think part of the work that we can do, at the, just to pick up on that, some of the work that the uh, global office can do is to reflect on previous attempts, successful or not, to do a similar type of work. And that, that itself is such an instructive exercise. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Maybe time for one more question. One or two more questions, depending on the length. And your talks are very full of inspiring, uh, inspiring ideas. And uh, <clears throat> now we are starting the project, but myself have two difficulties. One is that there is diversity in Japan. And I sometimes feel that diversity in Japan is bigger than differences between Japan and other countries. So it is very difficult for me to imagine Japanese model. So uh, I would like to receive any advice from you. Another difficulty is that uh, I cannot really imagine what kind of audience would be interested in our result. <laughs> I'm rather uh, pessimistic because I used to study in the University of Birmingham and there were a variety of people from abroad. And of course we had interesting discussion as friends, but uh, so apart from that friendship, I couldn't have, uh, I couldn't imagine the audience who are seriously need information of Japanese education. So I would like to know what's the possibility of the uh, impact of the outcome of the project. Uh, Professor Takayama suggested that if we produce powerful theory, which totally changed the European theory, that would have impact. But to, at the moment, I cannot really imagine that kind of <laughs> theory, so I would uh, appreciate any advice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll start off, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I think it's a fundamental question that I think we need to get this question right for the Global Education Office, isn't it? It's a fundamental question. I think we have to have a perfect answer for that question, right? <laughs> um, 
Uh, so the first point, I think, as I understand, is that there's an, there's an enormous diversity within Japan. So what's the point of uh, something distinct? What's the point of recognizing something distinctive about Japanese education? And then the second part of the question was: Is there any actual interest outside Japan in Japanese education? <clears throat> I think the point, one of the points I made was this um, intra-societal diversity and inter-societal diversity. So there's an always tension. And I think Japanese researchers tend to look at overall the politics of difference within the nation state. And then international scholars like uh, Joe, Joe, for example, look at Japan as, as a unit of analysis, as a meaningful unit of analysis, right? So there's an assumption, I guess this is going back to the discussion around assumption. The assumption that international scholars are making is that it is meaningful to look at Japan as a unit of analysis, right? There's something interesting going on in Japan that needs to be talked about. Then on the other hand, Japanese folks are saying, well, we're more interested in the politics, within, politics of a difference within Japan. So there's a considerable difference in the way people outside Japan and inside Japan talk about Japanese education. And oftentimes, there's a glaring, glaring gap, almost discommunication between folks inside and outside Japan. So there's so much negativities about Japanese education within Japan. No one seems to be talking positively about Japanese education. But if you look at any international literature, of course, it's declining, but still there. But many of them, for example, Joe's work, it's quite positive, right? And it's, quite, it's actually quite surprising to many of the Japanese scholars to read the positive account of Japanese education. <laughs> so I guess going back to the discussion around assumption, looking at international scholarship on Japanese education allows us to perhaps start recognizing a nation state as a meaningful unit of analysis. I know there's a whole discussion around a methodological nationalism and critique of it. But given this circumstance where in Japan, everyone seems to be so negative about Japan, perhaps it's time to recognize nation state as a meaningful unit of analysis and then learn for international scholarship. Although, as I said in my talk, there are many issues that needs to be worked out. So that's my response to the first question. Then I'll pass it on to someone else. So there are two reasons maybe you're, you're worried about why people might not be interested. Uh, partly a fear that the outside world has lost interest in Japan, what is sometimes called Japan passing. Um, and this is normally related to the idea that you can only be interested in one East Asian country at a time, and China has to be that country at the minute, and therefore there's no room to be interested in uh, Japan. This is a tragedy and a crazy idea, but there's some truth in that. Uh, certainly in my country, there's an absolute fixation of China, uh, which is bizarre because Japanese investment in the UK is massive. There is no Chinese investment in the UK, but still there is the idea that China is of interest and Japan isn't. The other reason I'm afraid is that people in Japan think Japan is not interesting. interesting. So people themselves in Japan don't think that they have an interesting story um, to tell. You have an amazing story to tell. Um, Japan is still one of the, the, the great powerhouses in the world. It's still the third largest economy, some people say maybe still the second largest, depending on how you, you measure um, these things. You still have um, the, probably the most highly educated population uh, the world has ever seen. Okay, so Finland does better in Pisa. Finland has got two and a half million people. Uh, Japan is a big country, which has an amazingly highly educated um, population hugely uh, impressive figures on all kinds of areas of social uh, performance and, 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 and so on. So Japan has a really important story. Please don't be so modest about what you can tell. 
you tell the story and then it's our job in other countries to pick up that story and to to run with it. I think this is a really important, a really important uh, project. And, you know, of course there's diversity in Japan, but one of the strengths of Japan is a belief that you're only as good as your weakest section, your weakest part of society. So Japan is a society which invests at the bottom end. It tries not to have a tail. That in itself is an incredible a story that the world needs to um, to know about. Um, so please, please be less modest. Um, can I assure you that this is really a, an important a project, and we're looking forward to the the results. So please, please work hard at it. I think this question of uh, variation within a nation state is is really an interesting one. But what I have in my own Work, what I've tried to show is, uh, yes, there's lots of variation in Japanese early childhood ed, and there's variation in U.S. and in China, but the variation isn't the same in all three. So even what differs and what people argue about is also, in a sense, characteristic of, of the nation. So the fact that there's variation, I don't think means, so there's nothing interesting to say about Japan because there's too much variation. I would want to know, so what are the areas where there's variation? which also means there are areas maybe there that aren't varied. But I, I, I've always put the problem back onto the people I study and ask them, so what are you guys disagreeing about? Or what are you worried about? And, uh, and I think that's very interesting. A confession, going off Roger's point, in 1989 we published Preschool in Three Cultures at a time when Japan was number one in Japan. And there was this immense interest in Japan. So it's called Preschool in Three Cultures, Japan, China, and the U.S. In 2009, we did Preschool in Three Cultures Revisited, China, Japan, <laughs> and the U.S. Uh, so there is some kind of marketing issue. But still, what I, China had changed so much that that was the big story. But what we wrote is change is sexier than continuity. And success is kind of more attractive than failure. So there is a, an audience more for stories of who's succeeding and who's changing. But what I, we wrote in the book is, actually, continuity takes, is really interesting, too. And it takes more, it's like to stand in a, fa, in a fast-moving stream and not change takes more energy than to go with the flow. So I think, you know, we have to fight against, even when things seem to be just kind of stagnating, that's interesting in itself. Then the other thing I'd say is, yeah, there's less interest in America right now in Japan, but I think there's a story we're not telling, which, is inter which would be compelling. When we did the interviews in 1984, Americans were interested in Japan, but Japan had a more positive self-image, and so we were hearing more positive stories. When we went back 20 years later, a lot of the early childhood people we talked to had a sense of, like, we blew it, like our time has passed, Parents are getting worse. Teachers are getting worse. But that narrative of kind of um, arrived at the postmodern moment and it turned out we blew it is one that I think resonates with a lot of other countries. So Japan, the fact that Japan seems to no longer have that energy of about to do something great is actually an interesting story to tell. And I think other countries are feeling a similar sense of pessimism and kind of exhaustion. So just kind of to compare pe these kind of cynical, pessimistic stories about things we no longer have this ability we once had to feel optimistic and in control, I think is, uh, can be compelling if we start telling, telling it in the right way. Great, I think those were great uh, final comments from all three panelists. I'd now, uh, we're going to close the panel discussion and uh, before I do that I'd just like to give them a round of applause for their speeches and also the response.